Hello, I'm Sydney Meyer, speaking to you from Don't Tell Mama on Restaurant Row in the Theater District in New York City. I will be speaking with Rabbi Saul Solomon on Dave's Gone By on UNC Radio. Oh, shalom, my friends, shalom, my enemies. This is your old pal, Rabbi Saul Solomon, founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And oh, life is a cabaret, my friends and old chums, because I love to talk about the theater and nightclubs and nightlife and singing and performing. Someone who does that himself, but has also served as the springboard for so many others, is with me right here in New York City at the club for which he serves as the booking agent. His name is Sidney Meyer, and he is literally synonymous with this club on West 46th Street. Don't tell Mama. Among the people who appear here regularly are folks like Ricky Ritzel and Rosemary Lord, Bobby Horowitz, Sharon McKnight, Jay Rogers, Seth Rudetsky, hosts more who either got their start here or poke their heads in just to keep themselves in the game because otherwise they're doing TV and uh, radio and shit like that. But no, we're here with Sidney Meyer. Shalom to you. Shalom. How Rabbi. Are you? Oh, thank you. How are you, Sydney? How are you I'm doing? doing quite well. Good. It's always bad times for cabaret and nightlife. How's Don't Tell Mama doing? Well, just like they've always referred to uh, the Broadway theater as an invalid, I think uh, going back forever, one could say that all nightclubs and cabarets are hanging by a thread. What business isn't. I mean, when you think of it, who would have ever thought bookstores would go away? All the little bookstores or all the little record stores, for instance. Uh, however, we've been very fortunate at Don't Tell Mama. It started in 1982 and it doubled its size in 1992. It is really four rooms. It's like a little cabaret mall. There is a restaurant in one room, two showrooms, two separate cabaret rooms, and then there is the world-famous piano bar where every night from nine till three or four in the morning there are bartenders and waiters singing and anyone from the audience can get up it's sort of a cross between an irish pub a german beer hall and bourbon street and so many famous people have come through the doors to get up to sing in this such as such well going back years uh, uh, martha ray johnny ray liza Min Nelly, Rosie O'Donnell, uh, Michael Feinstein. It, it's, it's a party every night, we, although we cannot guarantee a celebrity sighting, but it, it's the only place quite like this in the theater district, and people come from all over the world to enjoy it. And for instance, the singing servers are, in addition, of course, to their talents as servers, they have amazing credits. Uh, one of the gals that works now as a bartender played on Broadway as Tracy, the heavy set girl in uh, Hairspray. Oh, yeah. 400 performances. Another fellow who's a bartender has worked on the television show Gotham, and he's been on Broadway. I mean, it's this level of uh, excellence in singing, but, you know, sometimes gigs end and they have to support themselves between jobs, too. Oh, I know. I mean, sometimes uh, I would see Jay Rogers here back in the day. He was here for many years, yeah. and he's still, in fact, he's performing in a show Friday night, Ricky Ritzel's Broadway, which three years in a row has won Cabaret's Oscar, which is the Mac Award. Oh, yes. Called Ricky Ritzel's Broadway, which is a tribute to Broadway shows, and he has, and Jay has been in Broadway, off Broadway. He's fabulous. But you said that the club itself started in in 1982. Yes, it did. But it, did it morph out of panache, or was that something completely different, or what? No, I worked for seven and a half years prior to Don't Tell Mama in the 1980s at a darling yeah. supper club called Panache. Sure, sure. It was in the Magic Pan restaurant. People who appeared there 
included a Broadway star Carol Lee Carmelo, oh, yeah. Jonathan, Marin Maisie, who's been up for three Tony Awards, brilliant Broadway star. Most uh, poignantly, a fellow who I booked there circa 1983-84, brilliant yet tragic figure, Jonathan Larson, oh. who composed Rent and who passed away before its opening night and then it went on to win the Pulitzer Prize and several Tony Awards. But what happened was the original owner of Don't Tell Mama had it from 82 to 89. And that and those in that seven and a half year time, I was at Panache. When Panache ended, the original owner had decided to sell and move on to a club in the village called 88s. And so new owners came into Don't Tell Mama. They were looking for management and people knew me from Panache. So I found a home on 46th Street. Who are the current owners of Don't Tell Mama? Well, there's lovely people and, and uh, they have had it for about 12 years. It's a third set of owners over this period. When they came in, they totally renovated the place, upgraded it in every way, and made a restaurant which had never existed. You couldn't even get a clacker here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, not even matzah. No, not even that. Not no. even matzah. And the kitchen. And so we really finally have earned our place on Restaurant Row because for many years we were the only uh, business that was on Restaurant Row that was not yeah, in food. point of fact a restaurant. Yeah. So, but also, I mean, you've been doing this for so many years and you obviously love it. And you, But with all your connections with, with what you've done, there was never that thing in you to go and open a club that you owned as opposed to just booked for? Do you ever have that sort of, eh, no. No, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, people have said to me from the first day I was at Panache, which originally was owned by Quaker Oats, of all things, that went through three different owners as well. I learned at a very early age, not willingly, but uh, I discovered through one way might seem un unfortunate, but I had been the victim of several robberies in my teens, and it, uh, you weren't even in New York at this point. You were in New Jersey, right? Well, I well I, at this point I was in Boston, but it was prior to New York, and it slowly dawned on me after the third robbery that you never really own anything, even if you think you do, and um, so I made a decision then that that's not where I should put my interests in acquisitions. And uh, through the years back at Panache and through several uh, dynasties here at, at, at uh, Don't Tell Mama, it seemed like I was more devoted in the to these businesses in some ways than the people who did in fact own them. So uh, I, I'm not saying that's the current situation, but I've seen that. Well, so, a super cake takes more care of a building than a landlord does, you know. Well, often that is the case, and I've been devoted. I'm very grateful to owners because none of us would be working if it weren't for them. There'd be no place to go. But I, I felt like I was always emotionally connected to these clubs and to the performers and audiences I was indeed the face of the the club I was the liaison I was the person that represented the place do you work seven days a week I just look like I do well it, in fact I often I work six days and often I do come in on the seventh just because this is a business that thankfully goes seven days a week and I guess like so many things, there's no substitute for being present. Even though we're in New York City, millions of people, it, it, it's almost fascinating to me. This is like a little cabaret bodega. You might have to translate that for some of your audience members, but it's like this little freestanding place that has the most magical uh, history to it. It's funny, in a world where everything is owned by something bigger and bigger and bigger, This, it, it, the people that have come through these doors, uh, I have booked people that were younger than eight, 
and over 80, but whatever their chronological age, they were often getting their first New York exposure in cabaret because truly cabaret or nightclubs are the first door open to people when they come to these shores before anyone knows them to put them in a show they put themselves in a show and they get on the map that way and when i think of the we would be here for days if we spoke of all the people who have stood on our stages and went on to the world stage, Broadway, television, motion pictures. And as I said earlier with uh, Jonathan Larson, who did play Panache and Don't Tell Mama, uh, people have won multiple Tonys, Grammys, Emmys, Oscars, and even him, the Pulitzer Prize. And we even had one person that went on to become the $100,000 grand prize winner on Star Search. But they, everyone yeah. has to start somewhere. So let me ask, as a booking agent for a place like this, how do you make that decision that, oh, they're ready? Maybe not, they're not ready for a big Broadway show, but how do you make that decision, oh, they can carry a 65-minute cabaret performance? Well, one doesn't always know. I always give people the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I think cabarets can serve many purposes. If we were a room, so to speak, like the long gone and missed Oak Room of the Algonquin Hotel or the Cafe Carlisle or Feinstein's 54 Below, where we were uh, charging considerable amounts of money and and presenting people at a certain level I know there's expectation of people having arrived but I think of Don't Tell Mama there's such a variety of performers we have two showrooms there can be people that just got off the bus with their valise and there can be people that have been in eight Broadway shows but everyone has to start and grow somewhere and sometime. Have, have you witnessed like someone who started here essentially and then stayed here for a couple of years and the first time you saw them do their their show you were like all right they got some talent there they're good and then as they kept doing shows and coming back here months and years later three years later you go like oh oh they're gonna be famous or they're gonna be on Broadway if they're not already. Well I have many talents too but I am not uh, psychic. I never know how life will unfold for anyone, but I often do see, and it would be hard to miss, anyone who really had a genuine spark of talent. And many people do come back here after years and even decades after they've made it really big. For instance, Alice Ripley, the Tony Award winner, did her first show here and came back like 20 years later. Then we have Karen Mason, who opened Don't Tell Mama in 1982 with the late beloved cabaret singer Nancy Lamott, they both opened it and she came back several years ago, was booked after she starred on Broadway and Mamma Mia and, and Sunset Boulevard of Jerome Robbins Broadway, she came back for eight shows that turned into 16, selling out everyone, a rave in the New York Times. She won two of Cabaret's Oscars, the Mac Award for that show. So yes, I do see people grow and improve, but I never know how the stars are going to align for anyone. Now, now let's talk about the rising of your star, Sidney Meyer, about your being a little kid in New Jersey. Uh, uh, sorry uh, to say something. Uh, outside of Philadelphia, real. Oh, it was, it, was, it, was not, it was Pennsylvania you were. But that's close to New Jersey. Fair enough. Jewish? Yes? Yes. How Jewish? Well, we were, uh, my family was conservative. I went to Hebrew school every week. I went to Sunday school. I was bar mitzvah. I was confirmed. Uh, our family kept kosher. So we always uh, were, you know, respectful and it did indeed follow the faith. Just curious, being a rabbi here, uh, how Jewy are you now? Do you still believe in God? Do you yes, still celebrate I do. anything? I do. I'm not as um, conscientious about going to services as I used to. Shame on you! 
But I do think that, in a sense, uh, music is very healing and spiritual. So I do think that that's one of God's gifts to us. So I am in a temple of music seven nights a week, and often there is more than a minion present. <laughs> well, nowadays, minions is men and women, too, so it counts. Other kids, they may want to be doctors, firemen, stuff like that. What did you think you would be? when you were five or seven year old little Sidilet? Well, I never was exactly uh, normal or the boy next door and I, my interest, I always gravitated toward music and entertainment and I always wanted to be part of that world. I didn't know how or if it was going to be possible but I did always have that as a dream and it did come true that I got to and to do perform and and uh, I never thought of myself as a, a strictly a singer in the sense of a cantor or someone with a gorgeous voice I thought of myself more as an entertainer and I always had the example of so many great people who were stars in the 20th century that might not have had a perfect voice but we're great show people, and that's everybody from Carol Channing to Jimmy Durante, from Sophie Tucker to George Jessel, Gwen Verdon, Marlena Dietrich. I mean, they weren't particularly known as great singers, but they were fabulous entertainers. Totally. Now, tell us about the show that you do. What I find kind of funny is that you have a cabaret, sort of autobiographical show that you do, but you don't do it here. Well, I perform here regularly. <laughs> oh. uh, this is the thing. I'm in many shows here, d variety shows, and I do a, sh a song or two. Uh, at Panache, for seven and a half years, I did my show at Panache, and I did do shows at Don't Tell Mama. The last time was in the early 90s, and I had not done a show for 25 years in New York because I was so busy clapping for everyone else. And about two years ago, the Mabel Mercer Foundation, which is a great organization which is devoted to uh, preserving the great American songbook of standards and encouraging cabaret artists of all kinds uh, from around the world, they said to me, uh, I, since you hadn't done a show in years, would you do a show as a fundraiser? And they booked two shows for me at the Lori Beachman Theater, which is part of the West Bank Cafe on West 42nd Street, because that's where they do their events. The last time I appeared there was in 1980. And uh, uh, the two shows sold very well, so they turned into four shows. And then they asked me to come back again last year, and I did again. And then this year, I was asked to do shows, just my own show, at, at, a, at a charming place in the village called Pangea. Part of it is, when I am here, I am 24-7 a manager. And when I'm in these variety shows and things, even as I'm walking to the stage, someone will come up to me and say, oh, we need more uh, uh, paper towels in the men's room, or we're out of Coke, or we need a change for a dollar. So I am constantly on duty, which is a manager's job anyway. Well, I, but I thought you were the booking. Oh, I didn't realize you were yes, but we me. all do multitasking. Yeah, it's yeah. a mom and pop store you, when you come yeah. to it. And I'm happy to do all those things. So for me, at this point in life, on the few times a year that I do perform, I like to just go somewhere else where if I hear a plate drop <laughs> or something go wrong, I don't think, oh, let that be someone else's problem. I don't have to fix it. I am just here to perform. And so for a few minutes, it, it's a nice change. I, I, I get it. I completely... What, by the way, what is the title, if it has one, of the show that you put together well, two years ago? Two years ago, it was a very a creative, a, original title. It was called Sydney Meyer Live at the Beachman. Oh, well, there that's you go. Right. And this year, it's been Sydney Meyer Live at Pangea. It's just the name of the place. But I do think... Uh, 
really if I give it a few minutes when I was growing up and listening to all these great recordings the albums back then that really excited me the most were live albums that applause and those people it, it just was it gave the whole enterprise another lift so I just love the excitement of live tonight or so when are you doing this again, either at Pangea or something? Well, I just finished a, a, a few shows there, and I'm hoping to go back in the fall. Oh, in the fall. Okay, so for, for now, it's a little bit on hold. But when you choose the songs that you sing yourself in Sidney Meyer Sings at mm -hmm. the Schmulsen's Backyard, whatever, what, what songs have you recently been doing, and how do you make that choice? Well... I am known in the, this world of cabaret for uh, novelty songs, the vaudevillian songs. Um, it be, I'm attracted to them humorously, and whatever the song is, my yardstick for choosing it is to say if it's a silly, funny song, or even if it's a touching ballad. I have to connect with it. If I'm not connecting with it, the audience won't connect with it. I don't choose it because it may be popular or on the top ten or the hit parade or because Barbara Streisand sang it beautifully and got a great reaction. To me, one of my gifts is that, uh, or the yardstick I use is to say, if I had to write a song on this subject, whether it's funny, silly, or deep, and I hear a song, I say, if, if I had that gift of songwriting, this is the song I would write, because this captures exactly my feeling, my opinion, my heart, whatever it may be. So that is always uh, my criteria. Do you ever coach? Or do you just book and... I have been asked for years to yes. coach. I have been asked for years to direct. And I do not do that. But what I have been doing over the last few years, everywhere from St. Louis to San Francisco, is people uh, have flown me out to speak about cabaret and answer questions. And I'm happy to do that. And I think that's a form of education. Sure. And enlightenment, and and um, I always try to be very encouraging to everyone because I think there is, as has been often said, a world full of no. But I think we have to have a little more faith that things are possible. Well, speaking of the no part, well, you know, don't tell Mama survived since 1982. Great location, obviously, and now you even have food. But why couldn't the Metropolitan Room? hack it. Why, did, why couldn't Michael Feinstein's own club hack it and he had to go with, with Feinstein's at 54 below? What happens to these places? Well, if there's a, a very uh, gifted writer named James Gavin who wrote for the New York Times and he's, uh, his first book, there were two volumes. Uh, one came out in the 1990s and one came out in the early 2000s called Intimate Nights, the history of New York Cabaret. And uh, I'm mentioned kindly in the second uh, volume. And if you read these books, you realize uh, that expression was ever thus. Most every nightclub that I ever heard of ever attended or ever performed in, from Rainbow and Stars to the Oak Room of the Algonquin to uh, 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 88s yeah. to uh, Rose's Turn to Helen's to Judy's to the Copacabana have all come and gone, big and small. It, it but, just, but 88s goes... But the duplex sticks up. Well, so why does the duplex survive? Well, the, you can count on your hand yeah. the the clubs that still remain. It's very hard to keep uh, these places going. I mean, the Oak Room. Who would ever think that would go away? And I mean, in Rainbow and Stars. I mean, these. Well, were, the Rainbow Room is back, isn't it? The, well, Rainbow Room, but Rainbow and Stars was a separate cabaret up there with glittering entertainment and. Danny Skylight Room across the street where Blossom Deary sang and John Wallowich. I mean, the ballroom, these are, they had Eartha Kitten, Peggy Lee, and Karen Eggers, these are all gone. It's in New York, 
and I suppose like most places, one way or another, uh, you know, to keep up with all the codes and the taxes and the real estate. And, you know, you can have the most wonderful artist. And if one night it's pouring rain, they can be singing to the waiters because no one's going out. I mean, there's so many factors to keep any business afloat. Who would think that Tower Records and Virgin Records oh, wow. would go out at New York and Doubleday booksellers? I mean, there's so many different places that were we thought institutions and they're forever and they go away well just a few months ago they changed an insane law from uh, that's been around for decades and decades about not having was it was a dancing in nightclubs or you, or you had you had to have a cabaret license in order to have people get up and dance which was silly but i, I guess it sort of helped you because you guys have a cabaret license i assume well you know this was sort of a misnomer back in the 20s or whenever it was what a cabaret license was for was really for places that had dancing not what we come to know as cabaret with entertainment it really now is for places uh, that like swing 46 which is down the block from us where they have abandoned dancing or discos so when people thought about cabaret licenses it wasn't for live music it was the ability to dance well we never have had dancing people don't come to uh, yeah. here, uh, dance here they come to watch and listen to music our rooms are all listening rooms so that hasn't changed any not really that. for us i mean except we always had a sign up that said no dancing but there weren't well, wait, you could have because you have a cabaret license. But, but the thing is, they have different codes and uh, stipulation, but that was never what we had room to do. We're very little place. Right. Um, and, and again, I understand the, the codes and the taxes and everything else, but you, you sell liquor. I mean, one would assume it's almost like gambling, that, that if you can pour 40 cents worth of liquor into a shot glass and charge whatever, $8 for it, isn't... You should be making money hand over fist, or is it just rent is in and sale? Well, if you would, uh, for instance, uh, you could retire very happily on what our electric bill is, <laughs> with all the stage lights and all the things. Oh. There are a million costs that people never figure, from piano tuning to lights to, I mean, all sorts of salaries and kitchen people. And, I mean, they're, it's very costly to give anyone a living wage and to keep any business going all the different expenses we you know if you just think about your own life and your own home and all the different things that people may not see what what it costs to keep things alive well in businesses especially in new york i mean sadly a lot in one way there are always new places but you can go up and down second and third avenue very popular neighborhoods and see one story after another that's vacant yeah. people just can't keep up and I, I totally understand by the way we're keeping up here with sydney meyer the booking manager of Don't Tell Mama over on West 46th Street. This restaurant row is... This is Restaurant Row, world famous block. And you know, the, you, nobody would believe in this little cabaret, the people that have walked through the doors from Bette Midler to Paul Newman, from Liza Minnelli to Donald Trump. Right, I mean, you, know you can't imagine. Tell me anecdotes. Give me, uh, they don't have to be nasty or gossipy, but tell me some fun well, memories of famous people. Well, uh, a few, we've had many and they've, have great uh, people come to see shows. I remember one time, Liza Minnelli has been here many times. And uh, one time after they passed in uh, Manhattan, the no smoking law, she, because everybody used to be able to smoke in cabaret rooms and restaurants, but she came in one night to see a show in our showroom and it was packed. There must have been 70 some people and they make an announcement, no smoking. And uh, in, after the first song or two, she opened her purse and she pulled out an ashtray and started to smoke. And uh, I, the staff said, well, what do you want to do? Well, I was not going to say anything. None of the waiters or servers were going to say anything. And not one customer did because it was Liza Minnelli. I'm not saying that's correct, but no one did. But the funniest thing was... After the show was over, and she was a wonderful audience member, one of the customers went up, took the cigarette butts out of the ashtray <laughs> with her lipstick imprint on it and said, I'm selling these tonight on eBay. Excellent.
Yeah, and, and let's be happy she didn't do a line of blow, quite honestly. I mean, <laughs> so, but other, other memories of amazing people. Funny well, stories. Uh, a, a few years ago, one night, well, see, um, I'm trying to describe this to the radio audience. Sure. Uh, our restaurant and our piano bar are on the street, and both showrooms are behind them in the right. back. They're not literally on the street. I mean, there's there's glass. There's a front of the building, but they're pitched towards the, the block. Well, people yeah. can walk off the street and right. walk into them. Yeah. And then the, you have to walk through the restaurant or through the piano bar to get to the music rooms. Well, one night, uh, the host wasn't at the front door, and we were expecting a lot of people f uh, for a show in the back and they said to me Sydney the host isn't there and a lot of people are coming in will you go to the front door and just you know if people aren't will you wait there and point people in the direction if they've never been here of course well I was standing there and pointing different people and all of a sudden this little tiny lady walked in very uh, delicate and proper and I almost fainted because there I was looking at Bette Midler. Now, I have been seeing her since the 1970s, Radio City and Broadway shows and on the movie screen. And her presence is so gigantic and enormous. And she's such a, a, a huge, you know, show woman and scream. You know, she's even still in Hello, Dolly. She still fabulous. is. Fabulous. Yeah. But when this little person came in and she was so understated and I just couldn't believe it was that same person who's on fire on stage and I just said oh may I help you and she said oh yes thank you I'm here to see the show and I said oh, oh, okay let me lead the way so I started walking her through the piano bar and you go behind the piano to get into the showroom and when I started to turn the corner behind the piano to get to the showroom she said oh oh no I don't want to go backstage and I said oh no this this is our <laughs> piano bar this isn't the showroom I'm taking you to the showroom and she said oh thank you very much and I was able to say I just want to thank you for all the happiness you have brought the world all these years and she said thank you very much but it was just such it was such a, a, a different person than that larger yeah. than life, you know, over the top performer, right, yeah. entertainer that I've come to know for all these years. And you would have never thought it was the same person. Now, did you ever get to meet, um, I guess, your idol and, and the idol of, of a lot of cabaret people and, and gay people, Julie? Yes, I did, and I uh, I loved her, and I think I was luckier than most in the sense that I went to see her four different times, and three times she showed up for the show, and each time she was amazing, and I did get to meet her, and my life changed forever. I, I've been very fortunate uh, to have seen everyone live from... Uh, Josephine Baker and Bing Crosby to Marlena Dietrich and Ella Fitzgerald. I mean, Mike Nichols and Elaine May as a comedy team. And then meeting people like Peggy Lee, Ethel Merman, Carol Channing. Uh, and they were all great. Everyone is great in their own way. I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I do mean to interrupt you. You look about 50-something years old. How old are you? Well, I, we don't have to go there. Uh, but, but, yeah. but, but what I will say is, to this minute, the most electrifying performer I ever saw was Judy Garland. Her effect on an audience, as powerful and emotional as she is on recordings or film or television, it still cannot capture the in-person presence. And for me, it was like meeting E.T., my life changed forever because she was, I just, you, there's no way, I don't have the words to capture how she could uh, excite an audience and, and delight them. And to this minute, it was one of the greatest moments of my life, uh, in addition to seeing her do shows, to, to meet her. And how was she when you shook her hand or thanked her or? She was wonderful. 
She say anything that you recall? I mean, you probably uh, memorized. We, uh, we bonded. I thought I was awake in a dream. Mm. You touched the hem of her garment, so this li probably literally, but but so. Well, speak, yeah. I, I actually touched her flesh, but it was beyond that. Uh, her, her eyes, her, her presence was uh, memorable. All right, let me throw you a, curve, a curveball on this. It won't, it won't be the same experience, but is there a male performer that is? Not as iconic, but similarly, like, oh, boy, when this guy sang. Well, yes, I mean, I saw people, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, wonderful male entertainers, from Peter Allen to Red Skelton. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you somebody who really surprised me. He was, uh, for the, I, th I think, most of the century, of the 20th century, one of the most... Uh, leading male singers on recordings, film, radio, television. And I always thought he was a, a fine singer, but I didn't quite understand his magic until I went to see him live, and that was Bing Crosby. Oh. He was spellbinding. And as far as male singers, I mean, many great ones. I saw Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, Steve Lawrence, Andy Williams, Johnny Mathis, Anthony Newley. Robert Preston was a phenomenon as, a, as an actor as well. I mean, you know, as a, a presence, a showman. But Bing Crosby, really it was deceptive because he seemed so effortless and, and just... Uh, almost nondescript, not with a particular style and not with this a particular showy voice. I'll tell you someone who I never got to see in person, but I was a big fan of as a, a grand uh, showman and entertainer was Jimmy Durante. I thought he could, that's another example of someone who just you can't say it was his looks, you can't say it was his voice, but the package was irresistible. That's what my mom says about me, quite honestly. Is it? Well, she's correct. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm always proud of my irresistible package. But we have been talking with Sidney Meyer, the booking manager of Don't Tell Mama. Just one or two more questions before I let you get back to all the work that you have to do at the club every single time. So, I ask you, if you, let's say, have a Broadway show, you got a lot of machinery behind it to sell to an audience because you've got an advertising group and you have a press agent and promotion managers and they advertise on websites and on the radio and stuff. How does a small-ish New York club that has different performers every night, how do you get the word out of come see these people, come to this club? Well, uh... I think of the story they always tell about uh, the lady that created an empire of uh, Mrs. Fields with her chocolate chip cookies, and when she started baking them, she would take a little tray of them down to the town, the center of town, and give them out. I think one can never underestimate loving hands at home. What I mean, so many of these performers are so sort of enterprising and ingenious and bang the drum for themselves, sending out flyers and emails and doing everything they can. And we, as I say, because of now our history, which is going on to be four decades, uh, people know that we are a synonymous with a good time and entertainment and it's interesting so many people who've never been here may come here to see a specific performer or show that they know and then they discover the piano bar and they discover the restaurant and they discover uh, the whole entertainment uh, island that this is and they want to have it again and so you know it's just I don't think there's any substitute for word of mouth and people having a good time. And luckily, that's been the case through the years. Wow. And bless your hearts, also you mentioned some of these higher hoity-toity clubs where to walk in is $100. Here, you can a couple can come, they have to buy a couple of drinks, but you see a show and you get out for 50, 60 bucks with tip. Absolutely, and the, the, I think our piano bar is one of the most unbelievable 
of bargains in town. There is no cover charge for the piano bar. It's a two drink minimum. People can be here from nine at night till three or four in the morning. You never know what Broadway star is going to walk in, who gets up to sing. As I told you, the staff is all Broadway and television worthy. And it, 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 I mean, where can you go in this neighborhood and be there for four and five hours and see a parade of people all night? live at this level. It's, I mean, you can stay at Starbucks for four hours, but all you're going to see is people pulling the espressos. It's not the same. It's not the same. What Are you responsible, though, for the people who get drunk and rowdy or troublemakers, or, or you've been robbed before you were doing this, for, for criminals who come in and want the till? What do you do? Is, is that on you? Well, no. I mean, although I've, I've had some situations, uh, we're very fortunate that, amazingly, Amazingly, we are very fortunate that there, through the years, considering this is New York City and all the hijinks that go on here, we've been very, very fortunate in the scheme of things. There are very few things that have happened that were unpleasant. And, and this interview is one of them, by the way, with me. So there you go. That's, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, of course. And then let's do the two two thing from Fiddler on the Roof to make sure it doesn't happen. Toy, toy through the fingers. Well, I, I, I'm doing that all the time. <laughs> I mean, I don't think we can ever get ahead of ourselves. Uh, nobody has a crystal ball to know what's going to happen. And we're very fortunate when things go right. Alibi, alibi. Last question for the delightful, the charming, the wonderful, and the, the truthful Sidney Meyer. Favorite song of all time. That's so hard to say. I mean, I guess in my case, it would be like saying a favorite child to someone. How can, there are so many, and that's a I great thing. Well, no, I mean, um, I don't know if it's only the song, but I, I see the effect that so many people have maybe it's because of the mystique of over the rainbow and you know they they do something at the smithsonian every few years where they take the most famous song of the 20th century they have polls and scholars who vote on this and one would think now after having rock and roll for 50 and 60 years that it would be elvis presley or the beatles or yesterday or to, who yeah. touched the world and still with their classic songs but Whenever they do this, it's always over the rainbow. And I'm thinking that it must be, because that is a film that lives on. It touches every generation. It, even what I'm saying now is like they're wonderful Disney films now that will have a life, but not everyone of every age will see them. But everyone growing up from the 30s till the present day sees The Wizard of Oz and that yearning to want to go somewhere or find a life somewhere. I think that's such a human experience, and that's why I think people, in addition to its poetry and the melody, I think it touches people's heart, and so many people can identify with that song. And when I heard Judy Garland sing it, or even many people here, it's more than a song. It's it's almost like a prayer or a hope, and it just stirs people and and touches them so very deeply. Well, I am somewhere over the moon having talked to Sidney Meyer. Everybody, if you're in New York, please come to Don't Tell Mama, 343 West 46th Street, right by Eighth Avenue on Restaurant Row. See the people, meet Sidney because he's there six and a half days a week, even on Shabbos. We'll talk about that later, Sidney. A pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi.